Good afternoon. My name is Chris Hewer, and I'm here at Loeb, and I'm very fortunate to be joined by Social Sandy, Sandy Carter, who's leading up the social business efforts at IBM. And uh, I'd wonder if you could tell me a little bit about this book, Get Bold, that you wrote, and then we'll talk a little bit about IBM. Sure. So. Um the book Get Bold is about how companies become social businesses. It's built on the work that we've done since 2005, so not quite as early as your social media clubs, but pretty early on. And what we've done is we've taken 75 case studies, so 75 real companies, and we've shown what they've done really well, uh, what they learned from their maybe mistakes as they went along, and we set up something called the Social Business Agenda that provides an easy-to-use methodology for any company who wants to become or start to become a social business. Now, um, one of my five C's over the years, and there's three C's from the early days, I think there's five now, but was Courage. I mean, now in French, so I tried to do it in French very poorly, so I apologize. But but it, that's really what Get Bold means, to overcome those fears, yes? Yes, and it, and it really is about getting bold and moving fast to social because you don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be a laggard here. Unlike the Internet where you could catch up with money or with an IT department, this is about forming a relationship, right? And any relationship takes time. And so really it's about being bold, just taking that step, even if you're a big company, a small company, B2B, B2C, and starting, getting starting so you are not left behind. Now, it's uh, much more than a strategy. It's much more than technology. In fact, you have a good quote that you hang in your desk. And, and can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, the quote is, culture eats strategy for lunch. And the way that came about is I was asked by several companies, what is the one thing that we could do that would just mess everything up about our social strategy. And so I went back and I looked at about 120 companies. And I, I found those who, who were very successful and those who were not. And I found that the only common factor in every one that had not done well and those who had succeeded was their culture. And that if their culture was right, they could work through any other challenge with the technology platform, with the process they chose, with re-architecting something. But the one thing they couldn't overcome if they didn't address it right away was culture. Now, um, your work at IBM, you're leading up the social business efforts. You're certainly leading the charge publicly as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your work at IBM entails in terms of helping companies get bold? Sure. So I have probably the coolest title at IBM. I am the vice president of social business evangelism. Uh, quite cool. And so um, I also have sales and looking at our field marketing area. And what that means is that I get to go around and help companies figure out how to get started, to see the value proposition, and, and you know, really importantly, build a solid business case. Because while this is a lot of fun, the real thing that companies need to know is that this really and truly generates a strong return on investment and that that is the factor that should cause your company to start building that social business agenda, not just the fun. You're gonna engage your employees, you're gonna be more transparent, but the bottom line makes all the difference in the world. You know, it appears to me that this is one of those first times that common sense actually proves itself out quite well. And you've done some great measurement around this. Um, do you have any statistics that actually supports this sort of performance? Yeah, you know, uh, we worked with McKinsey and Company, outstanding consulting firm, and what, what they looked at was over a thousand companies to see if they inserted social into their business process. So not just put social over to the side, but actually insert it into a process. What was the impact and the effectiveness and efficiency that social brought? So just a few quick numbers. Um, customer service. I love customer service. Those companies who insert social into the way they provide service, primarily through social analytics, are seeing an 18% on average increase in customer sat. Those who insert it into their R&D or their innovation process, some people call it ideation or crowdsourcing, are seeing 20% faster time to market with a product, which is worth real money, and 20% more of their products are successful, which makes sense, right, because you've gotten this crowdsourced, but it's just an, an unbelievably powerful factoid. And the other one I really love is around HR. You know, with the war for talent out there, when you look at how you retain talent, how you recruit talent, a 15% reduction in cost by applying this to your HR process because you have happier employees, you know when something's going wrong, you can immediately take action versus waiting you know, a year for the opinion survey and by that time you know, you've gone through two or three challenges that you should have addressed it earlier on. 
So those are just some of the numbers. That's, that's wonderful. And there's another number I don't know that we have a number for, but um, we talked a little bit before about trust. And, and I think in culture development, that's one of the most important elements. And that's what's really, I think, challenging the cross-boundary collaboration we're all striving mm-hmm. for. Um, to what degree have you studied trust and, and what impact does it have on the success of social business? It's a great question. So, you know, when you build your agenda, the first thing you're going to look at is that culture that we talked about. The second thing is we help clients develop what we call a trust plan, how to create social trust and social currency. And we uh, found through our research that trust is built on uh, three crucial things. One is consistency, right? So you're not on Twitter once every six months. You're constantly communicating, right, forming that relationship. The second is that you are transparent, and that not only means open and honest, but it also involves the way you respond to information being shared perhaps with someone else before you and the way that you respond to that and the way that you share information. And the third one, which which I found really fascinating, is your ability to share expertise and knowledge. Trust is built by adding value, not just to yourself, but more importantly for others. And that's through providing that expertise as well. So in the book, Get Bold, there's a whole chapter on developing trust. What does this trust plan look like? Um, How do you identify a set of influencers uh, that are really opinion leaders for you, that 5 to 15% of customers who influence everybody else And in particular, how do you focus on trust with them? Because we've seen a lot of companies make mistakes of trying to buy their trust, and uh, you don't want to do that. So how do you develop that trust, and how do you form a relationship with them? Well, that trust internally is interesting because, of course, being bold requires change and innovation, and no one likes change, and consistency is one of the things that builds trust. So do you find those two in opposition often, or how do they actually maybe enhance one another? So, so, you know, it's quite interesting. Um, as you're looking at change, and change management is a huge part of trust, the consistency is about the way that you are in constant communication with your employees or with your customers. And so it actually, if you look at any great change management plan, one of the crucial parts of that is your communication plan and how you get that information out there and not hiding it and that you do it in a timely fashion. The same thing is true with building social trust. It's all about being consistent. And in fact, I have customers who now have SLAs, service level agreements, with their customers saying, look, when you tweet me, it's going to take me four hours to respond, two hours to respond, two days to respond, whatever the right answer is, so that they set an expectation. And therefore, when they meet the expectation, that consistency and promise of trust is fulfilled. So regular communication, certainly one of the strongest ways to engender trust. Um, One of the things we're trying to discover is what are the healthy and unhealthy behaviors of social organizations or social businesses? Um, Do you have any other examples you might be able to share about things that have behaviors that companies and people in companies in particular uh, have have basically done that have either eroded or generated more trust? Yeah, so um, I would say, you know, there is a company uh, up in Canada. Their name is Celestica. They're a manufacturing company. So if you own a Cisco device, it was probably manufactured by Celestica. Um, I got the chance to go up there and visit with their CIO and their entire team. And I think one of the things that they did that, to me, just built the strength of trust with their employees is when the Japanese Tasami hit, And that tsunami um, required that workload was redistributed and that certain things happened. Their employees actually got together in a community and made some changes before the management team or the CEO had an opportunity to do that. They took charge and they were empowered and they went and made changes. And to me, the, the way the senior management team handled that, not that it was their job or that how dare you do that, embody trust and encourage their employees to continue to innovate that way and to take things into their own hands. Um, I would say a couple things that have taken away trust. I worked with a customer and I won't tell you who they were, but um, you know, they started going out with an ideation site, so crowdsourcing site. Um, when we did the cultural assessment, we were a little concerned about senior management, maybe not being receptive to ideas and what happened was Once they put up the crowdsourcing site, in two weeks, customers gave them fabulous ideas and critiques on their product line. After two weeks, though, the CEO ripped down the site. He took it down. 
And the reason was, you know, I called him. I'm like, what's what's going on? He's like, you know what? I know where I want to go. I know what my vision should be. I know what, you know, think about Steve Jobs. He doesn't ask anybody. He just does it. That's the way I am. And so two weeks later, he ripped it down. It actually mm. would have been better for him never to put it up there than to put it up and then take it down. It signaled just huge volumes to the employees and to his customers. Uh, by the way, it's now been a year, and uh, he's no longer the CEO at this company. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a big signal and a sign that, you know, in this new social world, you have to have a se- social leadership. And CEOs on down are going to have to be looking at these types of situations and be willing to take advice and counsel from anybody. Uh, let me give you one more example that I love. It's from a Canadian bank. And uh, one of the things that we found was that one of the influencers of their financial instruments was a 20-year-old college kid. So he had a website up. Nobody knew he was 20. He was advising all these customers on investment strategies being 20 in college with his site. So instead of, you know, defaming him and making, you know, he was 20, what they did was they invited him in and we spent the day with him. We had the CEO and senior members of the wealth management team come in. They explained uh, what they were doing. They listened to his ideas. They changed things. And after that day, you know, he went out and blogged about the company, blogged about some ideas. And what a great trust relationship, right? They didn't have to do that for this 20-year-old kid, but they brought him in and he's now part of their team. And to me, that was like a great example of generating trust. And and now, not only that, but other people have hope and there's a model to follow and the goodwill that it generates is so much stronger. Yeah. Um, You have been a terrific agent of change inside ABM and you're you're becoming a great agent of change, I think, for the industry. So so thank you very much. But I'm, I'm wondering what advice you might have for others who are trying to be agents of change, who are bringing this into their own companies and trying to take this holistic social business approach. I would say my first advice is to look at your culture. And if your culture isn't ready for social and for change, first thing I would advise is get your culture set up and ready to go. And there are some things that you can do working with your senior team, getting champions um, to help your company get into that mode of acceptance of, of social. The second thing I would do is say, pilot it. You know, do an experiment, do something small, measure the return, Um, You know, develop some advocates for you, your brand advocates, and get going and show others. I mean, that's what we did at IBM, right? We tried small projects, like tweeting about an event we had and using a a code, and we found out how many people came to the event from that code, or posting a YouTube video when it was unheard of for a B2B company to post a YouTube video. So get out there and try something. See the impact. Um, you know, take a process. Uh, Royal Bank of Canada applied social to their customer service process, and it's one of the major elements that's taken them from number five in customer sat to number one. Uh-huh. In fact, I was just with another <laughs> Canadian bank, and when I was telling the story, they're like, "Oh, we just looked at the results, and we were wondering what did Royal Bank of Canada do?" And here it was, right? So I think that's a a great thing to start, you know, culture and then start an experiment. And I would say the third thing is to get started, a great entry point is to listen. Social analytics and social monitoring. Uh, There's a lot of uh, free tools out there that you can start and get your appetite wet. Of course, I'm with IBM, so there there are better tools when you're ready to spend money. There's a little thing called Cognos I've heard about. That's right, Cognos Consumer Insight, SPSS. Uh, Even IBM Connections has all that built into it. But... You know, when you start to listen and you see what your clients are saying, it's really powerful. Um, At IBM, I don't know if you knew this, we have a social intelligence group. So not the CIA, (laughs) but we monitor 24 by 7 comments about IBM. And we do that so that we can listen to our clients, see what they think about our products, about the way that we're marketing, about the way that we're providing support. And that, therefore, we're a social organization. We're ready to jump on those and change for the better instantly. And I think more companies need to have that social intelligence community inside their company so that they're listening. And it's a great entry point. Um, we're, we're really out of time, but I do have one last question because you hit on, on one of the topics I think is a hot button for me, which is um, a lot of companies think it's just listening. But it's not so much listening. It's how you mm-hmm. respond to what you hear. So what companies might have done well, or maybe one example of a company that's done really well, hearing something from their customers and changing as a result? 
Well, I think there's I think there's lots of great examples of companies hearing and then changing. A um, couple I would give are. Um, I'll give you a bad example first. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, and then I'll give absolutely. you a great example. Yeah. Um, Domino's Pizza, you know, when their employees suck cheese up their nose and then put the cheese on the pizza, videotaped it, posted it to YouTube. Um, when they found out about what happened, they listened, they determined what happened. It took them 48 hours to respond. They responded with a video like this, but their CEO was reading a script, and essentially all you saw was his head. Uh. Very um, non-transparent, not engaging. And so the way they responded was not powerful. And so to your point, you know, if you're going to listen, you need to make sure you're taking as much care about the way that you respond. Um, some great responses, I think, came out of um, P&G on the Motrin, mm-hmm. where you know they had supposedly tested an ad. When it came out, the mommy bloggers went crazy. They were monitoring, they were listening, and they immediately pulled the ad. I think that's really powerful. Um, IBM is a great example. We actually uh, listened. We found a couple of influencers, so not a lot of people, but influencers who make a big difference. We're talking about one of our technology areas. Um, And the way that we responded was not ourselves responding, but we let our clients know about it, and then they responded on our behalf and completely uh, kind of eliminated this argument, which was a- another fabulous way for someone to respond. Um, and I also think, one more example, is uh, Bill Marriott. Mm-hmm. Um, he has his own blog. So I would say he's listening and responding so proactively that he's actually turning himself in on certain things and is a great, I think, a great ambassador. Well, Sandy, thank you so much. I know you're very busy. I appreciate the time out of your schedule today. Appreciate all the work you're doing, and I'm looking forward to working with you more yeah, over the years too. ahead. Thank, thank you, you so very much. So much. Thank you very much. This is Chris Hewer and Sandy Carter here from Loeb uh, for the Social Media Clubhouse.